Name is Jack Barsky. I am a retired and reformed ex-undercover KGB agent. I spent 10 years working on behalf of the KGB, tried to like disappear. I resigned with a letter in secret writing. In 1980, Jack had been living undercover in the U.S. for two years. The KGB's first plan to get him a U.S. passport failed. This was their backup plan. Plan B was get a degree and that way you become a professional and then you can enter the straight on society where you could do some significant damage. So we decided on City University, which had a very low tuition and I still worked uh, part-time as a bike messenger. I took overloads, I took courses in the summer. I raced through the program in three years. Through some hard work, brains and some negotiation, I got three classes. I negotiated uh, the grade up from an A minus to an A. I was really proud of myself and then I get caught into the dean's office. I go in there and he says, you need to prepare your speech for graduation. I says, what? Well, you're the valedictorian. I said, oh shit. And this is the last thing I wanted to be, right? In front of uh, about 4,000 people giving a speech. I was supposed to be undercover, lying low. There was a chance that even the newspapers might pick something up, that the Russians might find out. They would have really read me the riot act. And I tried to weasel out of this, I couldn't. And I got away with it. I have one picture of me doing this and that picture is so bad you wouldn't know that it's me there was no recording there was nothing in the newspaper once I had a degree so th their idea was now go to work become a professional which will allow you a to make more money and B to make contact with people that are of interest to us directly. So I took a job as a programmer with MetLife. And this is, was one of those bad insurance companies that we were always told were really, really the epitome of evil capitalism, the exploiters of the workers and all that. And at the time I still believed in that crap. Then I started working there and it was really nice. It was so nice I fell in love with the job. That was the beginning of my slow conversion away from believing in the communist ideals. Thing about somebody who lives undercover in another country, particularly in another system, there's a shelf life. One establishes relationships and all of a sudden it's a possibility that one likes a new life better than the old life. The Soviets were well aware of that. What they were not aware of was that I was even more established than they could possibly have uh, feared. I had a child in this country. She was born in 1987. She was the prettiest little girl with the biggest eyes, and I bonded with her. When they decided to terminate my assignment and called me back to the other side of the Iron Curtain, I was torn because I had this little girl here that I loved a whole lot. But I also had a lot of reasons for going back. Well, they claimed that the FBI was about to arrest me. The other thing is I would have gone back to a, a hero's welcome. I had just received the second highest decoration of the Soviet Union the year before. I would have lived a good life and continued to live sort of outside the law and above the law in East Germany and the Soviet Union. That little girl kept me here. It was a phenomenal attack of what I today call a phenomenal attack of unconditional love. So I decided I wouldn't go back. And I came up with this brilliant idea and everybody who has ever heard it agrees with me that it's brilliant. And I told him that I had uh, contracted AIDS, A-I-D-S. In those days it was, a, it was a death sentence pretty much. And the last thing they wanted is to have somebody in their country who had that infectious, infectious and very feared disease. So they bought it and they told my family in East Germany that I actually had died from AIDS. So for about three to four months, I was pretty much concerned about my well-being. Nothing happened. The FBI didn't find me. The KGB didn't come after me. So I would now blend into society and become a bona fide American middle-class citizen and live the rest of my life pretty much undisturbed with the family and in the house in the country and so forth. About six months after, I put a down payment on a house when we moved into the suburb. So the mother of this child and I, we were married. I went to the INS with her and here's one illegal making another illegal legal. You know, I made a decision. Let's, you know, live the American dream. Buy a house. Uh, we bought a house about 60 miles north of New York. We had another child within about a year and that was the good life. We eventually moved to Pennsylvania to a house in the country. Nine years after the KGB, I was at the time, you know, low-level manager. I had a mortgage. I had bills to pay. I had kids to deal with in terms of school 
school. My daughter started playing basketball. It was just a good American life. And one day, special agent FBI shows up at a traffic stop and says to me, FBI, we would like to talk to you. My face went white as a sheet. He made me step into his car, which was driven by another agent. I saw that he had a gun strapped to his ankle, so I really knew it was serious. It was not some kind of a nightmare. First question was, am I under arrest? And the answer was no. I said, so what took you so long? They took me to a motel and we, and I was debriefed for a couple of hours and then they actually let me go home. Not without warning me though, the warning was, hey listen, if you think of running, we got about 50 agents, we have covered the entire area, there's no way that you can escape. We want all the information that you possibly have retained in your head and you can't keep anything from us. If we sense that you are holding back, you're somewhat insincere, you're going someplace where you don't want to be. Interestingly, all they had on me that they could have proved was that I was illegally in the country. They had no proof of espionage. If I had still been active, they would have tried to turn me and made me into a double agent. Obviously, that was too late. I had given the KGB the big lie, and for me to come like Lazarus, uh, rise from the dead and tell the Russians, hey, I'm back, can we do something together? That wouldn't have worked. I did operate as a trusted source for many years. Did you ever tell your wife or daughter about working for the KGB? I told both my wife and my daughter uh, about my life as a spy at different moments. Another twist in this story is that my wife and I had started fighting a lot and I was trying to like make this marriage work and at one point she, you know, she was at it again and I sat her down and I said, hey, listen, honey, let me tell you what I did, what I risked to stay with you and Chelsea, our daughter. And I told her about my past as a Soviet spy. Well, that backfired in two ways. A, she immediately said, oh, wait a minute, if you're not legal, then I'm not legal. The FBI had listening devices in my house. The FBI had my confession on tape. And within a couple of weeks, they introduced themselves. My daughter had to wait until your 18, uh, her 18th birthday. I waited for her to be an adult. I told her I risked going to jail and I risked possibly being killed to stay with you. She cried. What better indication of apparent love can a child have? and we still have a really, really good relationship. Do you regret working with the KGB? I have no regrets having worked for the KGB. Am I proud of it? Absolutely not. This is one of the most murderous organizations in the history of mankind, even though I didn't know that at the time. I got out of it that eventually I wound up in this great country here. I grew up in a country where emotional love was not the order of the day. It was a matter of survival. It was just after World War II. We were all poor. It was about getting enough food, having a roof over your head and, and having clothes to, to wear. And I grew up very selfish, not loving myself. I was not an emotionally loving person. And then this little girl came into my life and she woke up something in me that makes me now say when I'm asked, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned out of your life? Never mind the espionage, love conquers all. With that, I've become a whole lot more loving parents, husband, I've become a lot softer. That was not the way I started. To learn more about Jack's story, read his memoir, Deep Undercover.